Now the world's a hotbed of archaeological mystery and perhaps one of the greatest ones is Australia's Murray-Darling River system. It stretches across a lot of the continent but attached to it is a system of sand dune lunettes. They're round and they're up to a hundred meters high and in one of them in particular, Lake Victoria, are buried the bodies up to 15,000 Aborigines. Now most archaeologists believe it's a burial ground that extended across thousands of years. I believe it's the aftermath of a vast geophysical destruction and it happened very quickly. But what caused it and when did it occur? Come with me, we're going to find out. Southeastern Australia, down to the Murray Darling River system and Lake Victoria, that huge lunette. And then across the system, up along the Darling River, to more lunettes the whole way along. And finally, ending up at the Menindee Lakes and Wilcannia. What a strange phenomenon. So how does this all work? Here we have the Darling River flowing into the Murray at Wentworth, all the way down to Adelaide. But along this river system are lunettes. Here at Menindee, big round ones and back to Wilcannia, where the cosmic event occurred. All the way back down to Lake Victoria, the big one. And across to the old river system at Lake Mungo. All big lunettes, how were they formed? Many of the secrets of ancient sites have been revealed by taking a closer look from the air. We're going to take to the skies and get a bird's eye view look of Lake Mungo and Lake Victoria. Now they're circular in shape with raised edges. Were they formed by a cataclysmic event? We're going to find out. Okay. Pretty bumpy up here today and a bit hazy. But look at that beautiful round lunette. See the high sand dunes around it? What's buried in those sand dunes? And how was this lunette formed? Nearly perfectly round, and there's many around this area. This is Lake Victoria, Australia, along the Murray River. It's a huge inland lake and around me you can see the bowl of the sand dune lunettes stretching for kilometres. Just as interesting, along the southeastern edge of this lake, the remains of 15,000 bodies. When did this occur? What happened? Let's go back to where the mystery began. In 1994, Lake Victoria was drained to repair a lock on the Murray. But across the beach was revealed a carpet of bones, partially buried and fossilised. They spread over many, many kilometres. In this area alone, 70 bodies 
were discovered. Colin Pardo, the archaeologist involved, believes there are up to 15,000 bodies spread across the lake and in the sandy lunettes surrounding. There are certainly traditional burial sites here, but the vast majority are random and scattered on the beaches and buried in the lunettes. How can we explain this? Megafauna have been discovered on the sandy lunettes, exposed, and in the sand hills close by. Did they die at the same time as the Aborigines? In local Aboriginal mythology, the sky hero Nyarelli threw his boomerang every day, destroying the trees and creating the lake. He was the eagle hawk and he left Karinga or blood all over the lunettes. Pioneer Sarah Kerridge recorded this in 1856 and I believe it has the bones of truth. Let's leave Lake Victoria and its mystery of 15,000 dead Aborigines and travel up the Darling River to the Menindee Lakes. That's where the extinct megafauna are. Here the Darling River connects Lake Victoria to the Menindee Lakes. Look at this system, how weird. And on one is a megafauna site. Here it is, the back of the Lake Menindee Lunette. And here's the sand dune with a great blowout. Now strong winds do have their effects around here some heavy winds last year. But in years gone by, they've blasted out much of the sand dune and exposed these megafauna bones you see right in front of you. Thermoluminescent carbon dating on this site placed the megafauna at roughly 50 to 60,000 years. A conjectured Aboriginal site was dated at 40,000 years. That's well before the megafauna. This is if you accept the validity of carbon thermoluminescence and uranium thorium dating. I believe once you get an electromagnetic drama involved, the results become totally inaccurate. And this is where we begin our investigation into what killed the megafauna, when did it happen, and what happened to the massive amount of Aborigines that were killed, not only in Lake Victoria, but Mungo, and probably many other places on the Murray-Darling River system. I believe Lake Mungo and Lake Victoria were Australia's Sodom and Gomorrah. So we leave the Menindee Lakes and we go all the way up the Darling now to Wilcannia. And this is the site of a major cosmic drama. This was once the biggest port on the Darling River before they put locks in it and ended its golden age of prosperity. Look at some of these magnificent sandstone buildings. The courthouse, the hospital, beautiful old banks. Hard to believe that this was once the site of a catastrophic Aboriginal legend. Aboriginal mythology and tradition is all about cosmological warfare in the plasma of space. Comets are mentioned, meteorites falling from the heavens and killing people, planets disturbed in their motion, tsunamis sweeping across the land, huge hurricanes, huge destructive thunderbolts from the god, plasma formations in the sky, mountain building, river building, all recorded in oral traditions, handed down impeccably from generation to generation. And this is where the white myth interpreters get it very badly wrong. To the Aboriginal people, these events actually happened. They're not representations, they're not symbolic, they actually occurred, and not so long ago. We're going to consult with Murray Butcher, who's a renowned expert on the Barkindji Nation. Now, Elsie Jones uh, wrote this, I didn't write, she passed on from her ancestors this Aboriginal mythology regarding the Darling River, particularly Will Kenya, and your uh, grandson, obviously, and uh, can you tell us a bit about Elsie? Well, my grandmother, she was born on Albemarle Station, um, just down from Menindee. 
um, to a back and the woman of uh, a Scottish man. She was um, born in the early, early 20th century. Um, the upbringing was right through Barkindy country and up there. And so the Barkindy country stretches right down to uh, past Menindi down nearly to Wentworth, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, um, well what, from what my grandmother told me, Barkindy country starts just below, just below Louth and goes right down to the junction towards the, um, where the Murray and the Darling meet. Right. The language of the Barkindy was spoken over a wide area of Western New South Wales, and there was um, a number of different dialects that were spoken yeah. of the Barkindy language. Um, my yeah. grandmother came from the Barkindy dialect, which is the um, main stretch of the river, and I think the, I guess the Barkindy, Barkindy was a lingua franca okay. for the local region. Um, there was a number different dialects. One was um, Barangi, which was over on the east of the Darling River, towards going towards Ivanhoe, and uh, stops at the Mount Manara range of hills. Elsie Jones tells the Barkindji story of the place where a star fell. It's from Will Kenya in New South Wales. Alcara the wise man told the Barkindji that soon something very dangerous would happen. They had to move. They could see the sky was lit up, but there was no moon. They were terribly scared. Then they heard this rumbling noise from the sky, like thunder. And as it came down close, there were red streaks and a great big ball of fire came down. And there was smoke. And where it fell, many of them died. Many got burnt because there was fire within its belly. Then they had to move quickly because the rain was coming. It started to rain just like Malkara said it would. And it rained for days and days. The survivors kept moving to get to higher ground. All the swamps were full. A sea of water was everywhere. The Kinji that went south headed for Mount Manara, and to this day you'll see fingerprints and footprints in the rocks, because then the rocks were soft. Where the star fell on the Darling River, there's a big circle of rock. The old Barkindji called this bend Pearly na Grand Kalitas. That's the fallen star. When we came out here years ago, there was some different coloured stone, a sort of dull black, like you see in our people's old fireplaces. But it had shiny bits like black marble, and bits of green, and bits that were whitish like the fat in a sheep. Was all this cosmic drama involved in the formation of the Lake Waitchuga Lanets? On an Aboriginal painting, the falling stars depicted as a dark dot encircled by five or six concentric circles. Murray Butcher keeps this mythology alive with his incredible painting. And now we move on to our next location on the Lunette system, a place of inexplicable mystery. Here we are in Australia at Lake Mungo. We're at the centre of a bitter archaeological controversy. And it's all about these bones. Are they the same as the modern indigenous people or are they from a totally different race? Alan Thorne, who first examined these bones in 1968, thought they resembled the Zakudian cave people of northwest China. Are they different? Let's investigate. When Alan Thorne examined Mungo Man, he believed he had gracile appearance. He had much finer features and he was a slender build compared to not only modern Aborigines but particularly the cow swamp man he'd examined earlier. Cow swamp man is robust in appearance. He was buried in yet another lunette along the Murray River near Echuca. But what had become of Mungo man? 
And Alan Thorne's initial thoughts were he'd combined with the cow swamp robust man to form the modern Aboriginal. Further tests needed doing. At a later date, Gregory Adcock from ANU analysed the mitochondrial DNA of Mungo Man, LM3. He came to some startling conclusions. It was like no other mitochondrial DNA. Not related to the modern Aboriginal, not indeed related to the cow swap man who was meant to have come later, and not related to any other humans on Earth. Mungo Man had become extinct. What had caused this? And what about the megafauna? They were made extinct as well. Was it a similar event or indeed the same event that led to the demise of both of this genera? Let's take another look at Lake Mungo and see what could have happened there to possibly explain all this. Did the planets cast the mighty stones? The keys in the hill. It says. 